Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 35. Gospel of Luke chapter 12. And verse 35. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us? or for all. The Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating, but the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. That is the word of God, a warning to us and and encouragement to us then, as well. We're also going to be once again in the Gospel of Luke and this is at Luke chapter 16 as we continue our series on the rich man and Lazarus and we've given it the title, the series, the title, Hell is Truth Known Too Late as uh, one old Puritan minister put it long, long ago. Let's come then to God's word and ask his blessing on its ministry. Father, we do thank you for your word given to us, for the scriptures, for you revealing yourself to us, not just generally, but specifically, so that we might know the narrow way and discern it from the broad way that we might know the way of salvation of of our need to be put right with you and not only our need but also the means to be put right with you to be justified before you by faith in your son the Lord Jesus Christ we pray father that as we read and hear your word now that your spirit would open our eyes and our minds and our ears, our hearts, that we might receive your word uh, with, with genuine faith. We pray, Father, that in uh, any areas of our lives, any ways that we need to be convicted of sin, shown our sin, we pray, Father, that you would accomplish that and that you would grant us repentance. And Father, we uh, pray also that that we would see Christ in these scriptures. He is certainly there, and that we would grow more and more into his image. And we pray this all in Christ's name, amen. (coughs) 
I have a uh, <clears throat> book here. Some of you have seen it before. I think maybe a number of you haven't. It's uh, Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians, right? And um, kind of hold it for the camera there so everybody can see it. If you're going to get a copy of Luther's um, commentary on Galatians, this is the edition to get, the Crossway Classic Commentaries. It has a, a great inter introduction to it. And I was reading it this last week, and the reason I've been reading it is because when I was reading up on John Bunyan in his Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, his kind of his autobiography that he gives, he mentioned that when he, and he went through like years of, of spiritual torment before he came to, to saving faith in Christ. But um, he mentioned that one of the things that helped him the most, so he was, he, you know, he's living back in the 1600s, Luther's in what, the 1500s, so he found, that long ago, John Bunyan found this, Martin Luther's commentary on uh, Galatians. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, George Whitfield, Charles Wesley, John Wesley, all of the, his, Luther's commentary on Galatians was instrumental in them uh, coming to faith then in Christ. And I was reading, uh, anyway, I was reading through the first part of his commentary, and he spends time, one of the great things about Luther and about John Bunyan, as you'll see, is they don't race through the Bible. They don't race through a, a passage. They look carefully at it and think about it. And, uh, and so Luther spends quite a lot of time, several pages, talking about Paul's introduction to, Galat to the Galatian churches, which um, we see in, his, some of, in many of his other epistles as well. But uh, his introduction is, Grace and peace to you, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he spends time talking about just those, that little phrase, grace and peace, grace and peace. Now, you know, we skip over that uh, as just kind of a general greeting. He said this phrase was not known in the, in the world until the Christian, until the Christian era. But he also said this, and maybe I'll just summarize it for you, but he said that grace has to do with Christ and his forgiveness of our sins and how, um, how we are justified before God entirely by grace, by unmerited favor. So he said grace concerns, Paul is telling us, speaking to us of God's forgiveness of our sins in Christ. And then the word peace, grace and peace. He said, Martin Luther said, peace concerns the conscience. It concerns our recognition that we have received Christ's forgiveness and therefore we are at peace with God and our conscience is cleansed as we recognize it. And, it, and it, as I was reading these things, uh, he, he goes on, Luther goes on to say, even for Christians, this is difficult for us to cling to because we want to so often go back to the law and think that God is, is um, dealing with us, looking at us uh, in terms of our own performance and how well we, we are doing and so forth. Um, but but, but uh, at, at any rate, when I was reading this, I thought, you know, we waste an awful lot of time and energy in the church on what is called supposedly Christian counseling, trying to help people. You know, people are, are, are depressed or they're anxious or they're, they're weighed down with shame and so on. And, uh, and so we try to go into all kinds of methodologies and, and so forth to try to, to help them and, and, and deal with that. 
But we miss the primary cause, the, the, at least the place where we need to begin. And that is if, if when we are fraught with a guilty, shamed conscience, and burdened down by it, and we don't, and we don't know the, the reason. We can't sort it out, and it just goes on and on. The first thing we must ask ourselves or be asked by a counselor is, is well, are you born again? Do you know grace? It sounds like you are burdened by this conscience that's, that's weighing you down. Now, maybe you need to be. Maybe this is the conviction uh, of, of the law, but you will never be cured. No one will ever be set free of the terrors of a violated conscience, um, no matter how much mer supposed meritorious works they, they work hard at, like Luther tried to do for so long, unless, unless we've received that saving grace from God in Christ, and we've been born again. Well, that's just a little glimpse of some of the things that Luther gets into uh, right away, and I would highly recommend to you um, his commentary then on the book of, uh, of Galatians. He, both he and Bunyan, learned those things the hard way over a, over a long, long period of time. Well, here we are then, back at Luke 16, and I want to read uh, this account. These are the words of Christ. And uh, also, uh, one more thing of introduction here, all right? The, this, uh, this parable, this story that the Lord Jesus told, I think it's a historic event about the rich man and Lazarus, as, well as, as we see, focuses upon, primarily upon the experience of the rich man as he is in, in hell, as he's, as he's in Hades. And, uh, and so here this subject comes up, and, and one of the things that, you know, is very typical, it seems like, is that the world, uh, un unbelievers uh, uh, mock what they like to call hellfire and brimstone preaching. Uh, the greatest preacher of hellfire and brimstone was the Lord Jesus Christ um, himself. And what I wanted to point out, it's just a reminder to me and it's a reminder to you as well. Paul told Timothy to, be, to faithfully preach and teach these things, sound doctrine, and he said, let no one disregard you. So here is Timothy, he's a young pastor, he said, don't let anybody disregard you. And uh, you know maybe there were people that would look down on him because he was a younger guy and, and so forth. And but the reason Paul says don't let anybody disregard you isn't because because Timothy, you know, you're the pastor and you're the hotshot there, and they have to do what you say. You're preaching God's word, and as long as you're faithfully preaching God's word, don't permit people to use the excuse, well. That's just what you say, Timothy, right? That's just what you say. And that can sneak up on us, on all, on all of us, if we're, not, if we're not careful. When we hear the word of God, we are to uh, receive it for what it is, that it is, it is the word of God and not the word of man. Many times, and you've probably had this happen to you as well when you're, sharing the gospel with somebody or sharing a scripture or something, but I've had it happen many times to actually show people in God's word, look, this is what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians or, or something, and we'll look at it and go through it and try to apply it to their situation, and they'll come back and say, well, pastor, I, I, I just don't agree with you. And, and I'm convicted by this because... I, too often, I've let people get away with that. Now, partly because, you know, that does evidence a really hardened heart. But when Paul says, Timothy, don't let people, you know, command and teach these things and don't let anybody disregard you, what he's saying is, 
Don't let somebody say something. Well, Timothy, that's just your opinion. No, you, you call them to accounts on that and you stick my word right back in their face and say, this is the word of God. You can disregard me all you want, but this is the word of God. So when we come to this passage here in Luke 16, and here we are dealing with, um, well, I think it was at R.C. Sproul we heard recently say, he said, uh, if, if it wasn't so clearly presented, if the doctrine of hell wasn't so clearly presented to us here in scripture, and so much so by the Lord Jesus Christ, I, don't, I wouldn't want to believe in hell. I wouldn't believe, and you can see as we begin to think more and more about what eternity in hell, what that means and so on, that we, we can easily want to kind of, well, let's try to weasel around. It must mean, so no, no. This is, the, this is the word of God, the word of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So follow along as I read here, Luke 16, let's read it again, starting at verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores. Note the contrast. The rich man is clothed in purple, fine garb. Lazarus is clothed in sores, you see, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, Lazarus and like men are bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. That's the point. The point that we left off last time was the 22nd verse. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man, without ceremony, heavenly ceremony for him, also died was thrown in a hole, was buried. Death is the great leveler, isn't it? Whatever caste someone belongs to in this present life, whatever their social standing, no matter how famous or powerful or weak or unknown they might be in this life, everything is leveled by death. This is what it happened with the rich man and Lazarus. They both died. Now the leveling happened here in this world, just in that moment, they both died. But after that, it was anything but leveling, right? The, in, in, in all of a sudden, he who had been first became last. And he who had been last became first. Paul told Timothy, reminded him to remind the people, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. And the rich man 
had forgotten that his whole life intentionally. He was a fool. He lived, first of all, as if he would never die. You know, you do that, and so, and so do I if we're not careful. We, we need to be thinking about how, and Scripture reminds us how short the years are. How did uh, Lloyd-Jones, he would often, I think, close his, his uh, sermons? With something, it was kind of like, I'm just paraphrasing this, but it was something like, the Lord, Lord be with us during this, this lowly, he didn't say miserable, but something like that, uh, sojourn of our lives in this present world, right? It just is a reminder of how short our lives, our lives are. But this man, like so many people today, lived as if he would never die. He lived as if he'd always be wealthy. He lived like he could take it with him, that he would always have it. But now, suddenly, in a moment, that radical change took place and death came for him that day. He had a spiritual relative. We find that over in uh, the 12th chapter of Luke. And he said, here's a rich man, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. The things you've prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So this rich man, in the account of the rich man and Lazarus, was actually the poor man. And Lazarus, the poor man, the poor beggar, was actually the rich man because he possessed true treasure, treasure with God. Now, <clears throat> it's easy for us to say that we believe this, that yes, I recognize that when I die, I, cannot, I can't take anything in this world then with me, I can't do it. But we need to think very carefully about this and I think that you will find that there's more residuals of sinful thinking in us still in this regard that would kind of, we kind of do think that we can hang on to some things and maybe take them, take them along with us. You know, it's pretty classic that if you study um, death and dying and funeral ceremonies and so on down through the ages, people are, I think of the pyramids, right? You know, you can't take it with you. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can. We'll, here, we'll, we'll send this stuff along with Pharaoh. We'll send the servants along with him and, and so forth, that kind, that kind of, of thinking. But in fact, nothing, emphasis on Nothing that belongs to this present world, things that men and women typically give themselves in this life so that they can possess them, are going to go along with us when we die. Naked we came, what is that in Job? Naked we came, and naked we will leave. Now I think what happens is it's easier for us to convince ourselves that we believe that when we're thinking about material things, money and house, those kind of things. But the non-material things, I think this is where it can catch us up. Things like fame, reputation, and, and certainly possessions, but fame, reputation, and a name for ourselves, a legacy, right? I'm, I'm working, I want to, when I die, I want to leave a legacy for posterity, right, for the generations. Well, why? Why? What about, what do you mean a, a legacy? No, it could be in some sense for the good of them, my values, things that I valued that are good and right. And I, I mean, it, <coughs> it's a good and right thing to live a, to leave a Christian legacy to our, to our children. 
But what I'm thinking of more here, a sinful aspect here, would be the idea that when I depart this world, I can take that legacy with me in some sense of enjoy the fact that I left this legacy here. You know, I lived a life that is, that is memorable to future generations, but it won't come with you. The, the legacy will be, if it's a good one, will be enjoyed by people that are still here, but you're not going to be here, you see. Only, the only thing that we will enjoy then is heavenly treasure that's laid up with God by knowing and following Christ, you see. But you could have, for instance, uh, well, I want to leave this legacy and, of patriotism my country and serve my country. And there's a, there's a statue. People made a, a statue of me. Maybe even some town is named after you or some huge building or park or a freeway. Right? So people will give themselves to that. But, but understand this. When you die and you leave this world, none of that is coming with you in, 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 in any way, you see. And so, like this rich man, very typically, it's these kinds of things, that kind of a mentality that people would devote their, would dev devote their lives to, you see. We'll often have, you know, sometimes you'll go to a, a funeral service, say, and, and maybe some person was like a leading citizen of the community, and so uh, there will be great accolades and so on given to the person at the, at, at the funeral service. You're not going to be there to hear them. You will you ever show you how our thinking goes. I mean, sometimes we get to thinking, you know, when I die, there's probably going to be this number, going to be lots of people at my funeral, and they're all going to be saying this and this about him. And it's as if I'll be up, you know, I'm, I'm kind of looking down, looking up. No, you won't. You won't. You, so you can't take anything then with you. And that's what the poor man, anything except, of course, as I said, true treasure laid up in heaven with Christ, but it's there that we will enjoy it, you see. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, we're not told when, how long later, um, or how these two men died. Lazarus, we probably could pretty well figure out that he probably died in the ditch out there from his physical ailments that he'd suffered from for, uh, for so long. And the rich man, even if he noticed that, happened to notice sometimes uh, Lazarus isn't there, I doubt that he even knew Lazarus' name, uh, he was probably glad to have him gone, that, that, he, that he wasn't there. But one day, one day, here came death knocking at the, the rich man's the rich man's door. Maybe he lived on to an old age, maybe some other form of death met him, but he died, and that's the point. And his body was buried. But that's not the end of the story. In fact, it's just the beginning. It is the beginning of eternity. Think that through. <clears throat> Your life here is temporal. It's short. It's temporal. Um, your life slash existence after you die, the moment you die, is eternal. And it's either in hell, if you've been following Broadway, or it's in heaven if you've been in Christ on, on the narrow way. Now death, when am I going to die? The the time is only known to the Lord. Might be a long way off. I remember I was watching a movie or something there where a kid was talking to an adult and the kid was going on like, 
we're all going to die. It's being real morbid. We're, we're all going to die. I'm going to die. You're going to die. In your case, much sooner than me, you know, as he's talking to the older guy. But the fact is, he, maybe the kid would have died sooner than you. We don't know. And it, it can come slowly. It can come unexpectedly and in a flash. The only question is, are you ready now? You know, that was the emphasis of the scripture we just read. That be ready now, because you don't know when the Son of God is then coming for you. Will you be clothed in the righteousness of Christ, or will you be like another fool here? Matthew 22. When the king came in to look at the guests, there's a wedding feast, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment, and he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here? Without a wedding garment, he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why so severe? Because this is a picture of someone, well, like in, as you'll see in Pilgrim's Progress, somebody that kind of, they tried to come into the way over the side wall instead of coming through the gate you see and to sneak in and you can't get away with it you are not clothed in the righteousness of Christ you've come to the wedding feast of my son Christ and 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 so off to the pit with him so here's this great awakening for the rich man but it's not the great awakening to salvation it is a great awakening which is an awakening too late. He sees too late that he had entered eternity without Christ, and now the door is closed. Too late. It's just too late. In the instant that he, he died, he saw it. Look at verses 23 and 24 again. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. We aren't told in Scripture that hell is filled with some literal flame or burning lava or things like this. We're not told. I think what probably is happening is that the Lord is using these some of the most intense images from this present world to convey to us the torments and anguish in hell. And how, and uh, to, well, there really is an aspect, isn't there, in the Bible where the, where the Lord really does try to strike the fear of God into us, to, to, to wake us up and cause us to think about these things. We heard uh, R.C. Sproul speak recently in the Sunday school um, about Jesus, that sober question that someone asked Jesus, Lord, are there few that are saved? And, And Sproul reminded us, as I said earlier, that Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. Why? Why do you suppose? Because people in their sin Their problem isn't that they think too much about heaven or they think too much about hell. The problem is they don't really think about these things much at all. And they certainly, they would tend if they were to think about anything after this life, they would be given to more try to think about heaven. It's the doctrine of hell that they they will ignore because after all, they're not going to go there, right? Most people go through their lives. They're not terrified by the thought of the question, how can I, a sinner, be reconciled to a holy God? I'm a sinner, and here is this holy, holy, holy God that I have to stand before when I die. How can I be made right before him? You see, most people don't Think about that. They, what they do is they raise them their goodness up here and they bring God's holiness down here so that it's not some, that much then of a, of a threat, you see. Well, 
This was no doubt the case of the rich man. He was a Jew. You notice he says in, in Hades, he says, Father Abraham. Hey, he, he, he's a Jew. He knew about Abraham. What does that tell you uh, about his, this business of Moses and the prophets? That's just a way of saying the Old Testament. He knew about it. He knew about it. He would have been instructed uh, where in, in, by the rabbis in the synagogue, by his parents when he, he was a kid. He would have known about the account of the Israelites when they came to Mount Sinai and how the mountain thundered and they were struck with terror and they couldn't stand to hear even the voice of the Lord. He knew all that and he ignored it. He just, he just blew, he blew it off. He went, he chose to assume everything's fine for me because I'm a descendant of Abraham. There you go. I don't need to worry about in any of that. This scripture, the rich man and Lazarus, focuses our attention primarily upon the rich man in hell rather than giving most of the focus to Lazarus in heaven. It is intentional. Jesus wants to wake us up so that we don't end up in the same eternal condition as the rich man did. Um, wouldn't you want, don't you want to be awakened to danger? How can I say, what would be a good illustration here? You fall asleep on a train, on a speeding train, and it's headed for a cliff, okay? It's, and uh, people are trying to warn you, but you're asleep. You're just asleep. Now, would you get offended if somebody came up to you and shook you and maybe gave you, wake up, wake up, you know, we're, we're headed over here. Well, I, I, don't, I don't like you treating me that way. I was having a nice nap. Well, that's how the sinner generally responds to the warnings of Christ and the warnings of God's word and ends up going off the precipice and into hell. Listen to John Bunyan again. I mentioned last time he wrote an extended article and sermon on the rich man and Lazarus, and he entitled it, A Few Sighs from Hell. <clears throat> For as I said before, it is evident that those who live after or according to the flesh, in the lusts thereof, do not really and seriously think about death and the judgment that does follow after. Neither do they even indeed endeavor to do so. They don't even try to give it a thought. They just suppress that knowledge and blow it off. But death comes. The rich man, is he had, he had blown off these warnings all his life, partied on, but death came. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. He lifted up his eyes. We'll comment some more on that in a moment. Um, this is something he should have done long before. Now, <clears throat> we know, you know, what is Hades? Uh, we know that the wicked, on the day that Christ comes in judgment, will be cast into their final residence. And here's the account of it in Revelation 20. Starting at verse 11, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open. Everyone is bodily raised from the dead, okay? Everyone. There's a first and a second resurrection of the righteous and of the wicked. 
I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Now look at this. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So Hades, where the rich man found himself when he died, is not the final place of the wicked. The lake of fire is. So the term hell is used in the New Testament in several different ways. It can represent Satan and his kingdom. The gates of hell will not prevail against, okay? Satan and his kingdom. Or hell can be used to mean the final place where the wicked will be cast at the judgment, which in this case would be the lake of fire. But it can also be used synonymously with, uh, for, for Hades. Well, here the rich man is in Hades, a place of torment where the wicked go, those who are outside of, of Christ, upon death, and they await the final judgment of Christ. The lake of fire is their final and eternal destination. So here, here's this rich man. He's in Hades, and it's, but it's, it's, it's already in, he's already in torment, right? He lifted up his eyes and saw. Now listen, this, this is great. Uh, Bunyan, John Bunyan lingers on this, this fact that the rich man, you know, in, in just a moment, he's a rich man and he's feasting sumptuously, and in a flash, he's in Hades in torment, and that's when he opens his eyes, but it's too late. Here's Bunyan. In hell, Hades, he lifted up his eyes, he adds, being in torments, as if he had said, though once they, and now he's speaking of the wicked generally, as if he had said, though once they shut their eyes, though once they were willingly ignorant, yet when they depart into hell, they shall be so miserably handled and tormented that they shall be forced to lift up their eyes. While men, people, live in this world and are in a natural state, unregenerate, <coughs> they will have a good conceit about themselves and of their condition. <coughs> they will conclude, because these are many of them profess to be Christians, you see, they will conclude that they are Christians. Abraham's their father. And their state is to be as good as the best. They conclude they have faith, they have the spirit, they have a good hope and an interest in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then, when they drop into hell and lift up their eyes there and behold first their soul to be in extreme torments, their dwelling to be in the bottomless pit, their company, thousands of damned souls, also the innumerable company of devils and the hot, scalding vengeance of God, not only to drop, but to fall very violently upon them, then they will begin to be awakened, who all their lifetime were in a dead sleep. I say, when this comes to pass, and lo, it will, then in hell they shall lift up their eyes in the midst of torments they shall lift up their eyes they will see and what does he see he sees abraham and lazarus at his side in a position of honor far off far off away in the distance and he's calling on abraham to have mercy upon him. What did he see the moment the rich man died? What did he see? He saw that Hades, or hell, is real. His body was buried, but 
he wasn't in the grave. He would a million times wish that that's all he was in was the grave. He was in Hades. So death was not the end of existence. It was not the guaranteed paradise that he was just sure that he was headed for and he didn't need to pay any attention to, to anything else, you see. And he saw that the torments of hell were real. He was in anguish in this flame. People scoff, as we said, at the idea of hell. You know, hell, that's for people like Hitler. It's for, it's for the really, but it's not like people like me or, or anyone around me or most people, the vast majority of people. It's not, it's not for me. Even people, many people who claim to be, and maybe they are, you know, expert theologians will insist and argue that hell is something other than what the Bible seems to say. Hell is a doctrine that is only believed by the ignorant. You know, you're a fool if you believe that there is a, a literal hell. Our, their study of the Bible shows them, you know, God is, he's merciful and he is kind, if he is significant at all. And, but certainly this business of hell, that's a medieval thing that, that only ignorant people, superstitious people, would ever believe. They will find the day comes, many of them already have, that the day came and they die and they are in Hades and they lift up their eyes and they see that it is, that it is real. I put a note in your handout here at this point and I won't go into detail about it, but Perhaps in the rich man's um, torment and thirst, asking for this drop of water and so on, uh, uh, is there some indication there then that when Jesus was on the cross and said, I thirst, is that an indication that he in fact descended into hell as the Apostles' Creed um, states, you see? And you can look through those notes and and, and, think, and think about that. Certainly Christ did bear the torment due to us for all eternity upon himself then on, on the cross. Now listen, in regard to this torment, the torment in, in hell, listen to Bunyan again. You know, what is this agony? It's probably, uh, I heard some a preacher say one time, the wicked in hell will wish that the, the torment was only flame. And you think, well, how, how can that be? Well, listen to, listen to Bunyan on this. One part of your torments, he's addressing the wicked, uh, will be this. You shall have a full sight of all of your ill-spent life from first to last. Though here, in this life, you can, you can sin today and forget it by tomorrow. But there, in hell, you shall be made to remember how you did sin against God at such and such a time and such and such a place for to gain such and such a thing and with such and such a person. And this will be a hell unto you. God will, quote Psalm 51, set them sins in order before your eyes. You shall have the guilt of your sins all lie heavy on your soul. Not only the guilt of one or two, but the guilt of them all together. And there they shall lie in your soul as if your belly were full of pitch and set on a light, set on fire. Now, if that sounds too extreme, well, think about this. They have no redeemer. <laughs> There's no Christ. They bear, the wicked in hell, bear their sins of in themselves, on themselves, for all eternity. Bunyan goes on. Here in this world, men can sometimes think on their sins with delight. But there, in hell, 
with unspeakable torment. For that I, I understand to be that I understand to be the fire that Christ speaks of, which shall never be quenched. While men live here, how does the guilt sometimes, right, of one sin crush the soul? And just one sin, and yet God brings them their conscience to bear, brings them to feel their guilt. It makes a man in such a condition, a plight in this life, that he's weary of his life. You know, some people commit suicide, right? So that he can neither rest at home nor abroad, away from home, or even in bed. He can't sleep at night. Even so, I do know that they have been so tormented with the guilt of one sinful thought that they've been even at their wit's ends and have hanged themselves, I think of Judas. Okay? But now, when you come, the wicked man, into hell and have not only one or two or even a hundred of your sins, with the guilt of them all on your soul and body, but all the sins that you ever committed since you came into the world and altogether clapped upon your conscience at one time as one should clap a red hot iron to your breast and there to continue for all eternity. This is miserable. Again, in hell, you shall have brought into your remembrance the slighting, the ignoring, the blowing off of the gospel of Christ. Here you shall consider how willing Christ was to come into the world to save sinners. And for what a trifle, what a, a worthless thing you rejected him for. This is plainly held forth in Isaiah 28, where speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, the foundation of salvation, verse 16, he says of them that reject the gospel, that when the overflowing scourge does pass through the earth, which I understand to be the end of the world, the final judgment, then says he, it shall take you morning by morning, by day and by night, it shall pass over you, that is, continually, without any intermission, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. A vexation, that is, a torment, or a great part of hell, only to understand to re the report, to understand the good tidings that came into the world by Christ's death for poor sinners. And you will find this truly to be the mind of the Spirit, if you compare it with Isaiah 53, where he speaks of men turning their backs upon the tender grace of God in the gospel, where Isaiah says, who has believed our report? The gospels preach, but who has believed it? And the wicked will remember that in hell. Now this will be a mighty torment to the ungodly in hell, when they shall understand the goodness of God was so great that he even sent his son out of his bosom to die for sinners. And yet, that they should be so foolish as to put him off from one time to another, that they should be so foolish as to lose heaven and Christ and eternal life and glory for the society of of a company of drunkards, that they should lose their souls for a little sport, for this world, for a strumpet, and will have to look that word up for us, for a strumpet, for that which is lighter than vanity and nothing. I say this will be a very great torment to you. So in hell for all eternity, here is this huge weight of their, and an awareness of their own sin, of all of it. And this awareness <clears throat> of the great goodness of God and how many times the Lord showed them <clears throat> mercy in many different ways and calling them to himself and, how, and yet how they mocked and rejected the Lord. And now here they are in this torment forever and ever and ever. The rich man in his life 
did not bother himself with those kinds of concerns as he lived in luxury in the world. But that day when death came to his door, he lifted up his eyes and he saw it. And the reality of his condition struck him. And as we will see next time, he is still feeling it. He is still seeing it, even now, as he will forever and ever and ever, because, the text will tell us, between hell and heaven, there is such a great gulf fixed by God that no one will ever come out of that place who is in it. Luke 12, as you go with your accuser before the magistrate, your accuser, talking to the sinner here, who's your accuser? God. Make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. And those in hell will never find that last penny. They will be there forever and ever and ever. Put these questions to your own mind. Seriously and honestly, have you ever seen in your whole life, was there ever a time when you saw how desperate your condition was with, without Christ and in, in, in your sin? Did, did the Lord, has the Lord ever shown you mercy where you, you looked at these things, you see? And, and when you... And when the Lord enabled you to see them, well, you were the one laying awake at night, thinking about these things and feeling that fear. These are real issues. This is, these are the doctrines that as we heard in the first hour this morning, that we must hear when we come to church, when we come to the word, and we can't be just insisting that I want to be happy. I, the good thing is that God needs to make me happy when I come to church. You will never be happy in Christ until you first are brought to the terrors of Mount Sinai and are convicted then of your sin and, and you see the terror of hell and realize that you're on Broadway and headed for then destruction and that you might then come to repentance. Father, we pray <clears throat> that, well, first of all, we thank you for these words from your scriptures, that you love us enough to warn us in such strong language. You sent your son into this world to die for us and, and at the same time, though, to, to bring your truth to us, to show us our true condition and our need for Christ. Father, thank you for Christ. Thank you for the gospel. Uh, thank you that, that we, can, we know Christ and we're in him. But Father, we pray that if there be anyone uh, listening that is fooling themselves, that are, that are still on, Broadway and not concerned about these things, we pray, Father, that you would show them mercy and by these words in this scripture, strike the fear of you into their hearts. They might see their need for Christ and call out to you to be saved. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat>